I'm Timothy Luce for Appalachian Treasures, and we're coming to you here from the banks of the Greenbrier River in a little town called Alderson, West Virginia. Alderson is known as the Gem of the Hills, so we thought it was fitting that we launch our inaugural episode from the Gem of the Hills. Appalachian Treasures will feature people and places of Appalachia that make our region so great. And for this episode, we have Bill Hefner. Bill Hefner is a resident of Mill Point, West Virginia in Pocahontas County, about 30 miles north of Alderson. And he is a fine craftsman of guitars, and he's also a fine picker. He plays good old mountain music. So let's go talk with Bill Hefner about what it's like to be a musician and a craftsman here in West Virginia. I'm Timothy Luce, and we are here doing a special Appalachian Treasures, and we have a true Appalachian Treasure here, Mr. Bill Hefner, and he's been gracious enough to invite us into his shop and to talk about how he makes fine guitars for customers all over the place. And we're going to see some guitars that he's made, and he's going to talk a little bit about his process. But Mr. Hefner, thanks for having us today. We really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. Appreciate y'all. What's your favorite part about building a guitar? My favorite part is when I get a guitar together and hear what it sounds like the first time. And then the best, next best thing is the customer getting the guitar and playing it and a big smile on her face. Rewarding. Yeah. So in terms of the actual hands-on work, um, is there a particular part you enjoy more, planing the guitar or working on the fretboard, neck? What's your... I like doing inlay work. Mm -hmm. I really do love that. And uh, Like the lady from Tennessee, I built two guitars for her. And one, she drew a butterfly. Another one was a mountain scene with a string. It's kind of a challenge. It's like taking a jigsaw puzzle out of it. You make wood, stone, and pearl and all this stuff and put it together and try to cut it and file it with, with needle files and sandpaper so it'll fit together like a jigsaw puzzle. And uh, I've, I've got another one I'm planning on making with the, the GMC as an inlay. Hmm. I think a throwback to your truck? Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about that truck. Well, I bought that truck in 1975 from uh, Harry Fowler in Hillsborough. And, uh, That's the year he, I was born. Yeah, you tell me that. <laughs> and I think he uh, bought me, but it was black. And by the time I got it, it was it needed some paint and needed the engine and transmission, and it was going downhill fast. So the kids all got together. I didn't know anything about it at first. They decided for Christmas one year they were going to get together and pull their money back some the material and help put this thing together. Our, we had a son-in-law, a mechanic and a painter and they, So I uh, told him what he was going to do, so I got a bunch of money together and that's what I could afford. Got new rear fenders, steel fenders, I didn't get the fiberglass. New rear bumper and bra brackets. And son got the cab corners and mirrors and all kinds of stuff, glass. There was a lot of money and a lot of time and effort mm -hmm. went into it. And there was, they say it was black and they had holes in it. The fenders in the back were real bad. And uh, the engine and stuff would have taken a lot of money to put together. So we got a 79 Chevrolet pickup. I had it for a while. Ran good, but the body was falling off of it. So we used that running gear, the 350 V8, an automatic. But uh, but done uh, just disc brakes on it, power disc brakes, power steering. So it's yeah, it's a lot more modern. You can find parts for it. You can go anywhere you want to. Not to worry about it. Well, it sounded great when you fired it up earlier. Yeah. 
this is pretty unusual. I was going to keep it myself for the shop. He saw it and said he wanted it. Mm -hmm. This is, uh, I think this is Engelman spruce top. It has cherry sand hole ring with green, white uh, purfling. Mm -hmm. Green, white, and green purfling around the outside. It's pretty. <coughs> Curly Michael binding. So what inspired the color selection of, of green? Well, I was going to make an Irish style guitar. And, uh, so that's the reason I put the green. I was going to put a green on my fingerboard and headstock. And yes, sir. Sounds fitting. The back and sides are striped blood blue. Wow. It's yes. like a mixture of walnut and mahogany sort of all swirl in together. Yeah. And the other bloodwood, I've got some bloodwood binding stuff, is all the dark reddish looking color. Mm hmm. But this, this is really pretty stuff. Since he's a preacher and his name was Cherry, I put cherries on this finger. Uh, this is wow. red coral. And I put uh, maple. Mm hmm. And this is. Uh, I think it's jade. Beautiful. And you got red coral dots on the side with the curly maple bang. That is beautiful. And his headstock, I want something a little bit different for him. This is golden pearl. Mm -hmm. And for the doves, I didn't want real white. So I took a piece of golden pearl and turned it on the back. And did the dove and I engraved this. And uh, this is that, a piece of oyster shell. Hmm. And the stem for the olive branch is bloodwood. And this is uh, imperial jade, the leaves are. That's really pretty. Lots of hours cutting that out. I, I can imagine it. I imagine a couple of them break every now and then when you're doing that too, doesn't it? Yeah. There's one we're building for a friend of in Georgia. And it's Pocahontas County Black Walnut back mm -hmm. sides, And this is a back fort. And it has Pocahontas County Red Spruce Bracing. Beautiful. Which has to be trimmed up first. Mm -hmm. The craftsmanship you put into stuff people never even see, right? Yeah, they never see that. <laughs> Let's talk about craftsmanship for a minute. Those of us who enjoy working with our hands, sometimes it feels like it's just in our blood. But usually we've had people teach us along the way and show us things. So. Mm -hmm. Do you have any anyone or any people that have really inspired your love of woodwork and fine craftsmanship with guitars and even music? Yeah, I'd been wanting to uh, build guitars for years. And I was working a hot mix plant. I had to build a table, a table one day for a piece of equipment. It didn't turn out square, even. <laughs> so I need a lot of help. And uh, so after years and years of thinking, I was, I was my is my desire, my passion. I was supposed to build guitars. And uh, one day I just said, after 30 years, I told God, I said, I am through looking and trying to get somebody to help me because I can't find anybody. I'm done. So if you want to build guitars, you work it out. And I found out about uh, a fellow with West Virginia Economic Development who was a friend of mine from years ago. Didn't know he was working there. Talked to him within two months I had a grant. A guy showed me how to cut the wood and bend the side and cut the pearl and went from there. That's amazing. It's always somebody has to help you. And John Grevin gave me the patterns for my first guitar, blueprints. And I took about 100 phone calls to him. I kept asking him questions. And he's just a gentleman. He asked me everything. He tried to help me a lot. Well, and it's exactly what you're doing with your daughter. You're passing your knowledge on so it doesn't die off, right? That's what I'm trying to do, yeah. Yep. That's important. Part of what we're trying to do with the Appalachian Treasures here is showcase the craftsmen who have learned, the craftspeople, craftswomen, who have learned from others who are willing to share it and pass it on, and then they in turn do the same, and we keep those handcrafts alive, and the spirit of Appalachia lives on, right? That's right. Beautiful stuff. You're getting ready to show us this right here. Yeah, this is a <clears throat> soundboard for this Dreadnought guitar from mm -hmm. Georgia. And he designed the inlay and he wanted uh, two pieces of wall, eighth inch and quarter inch wall rings around the sound hole, which has to be cut out. And I put black and white around it. And this is uh, not a high grade 
spruce because it's got kind of wide green a little bit, mm -hmm. but it's got a fantastic sound. A lighter sound, right? With the yeah. with the wider wider green. What's this all about? Talk to us about what this means. Well, this is where the brace goes. So there's a neck block goes here that holds the neck. And then there's a brace that goes along here that stabilizes the top of it. And these are uh, little braces that go around the sound hole where it's cut out. They'll be cut out four inch diameter. Mm -hmm. Kind of supplies. I started the wood around it. And this is what they call the X brace. Is in this way. And you cut a notch in the top and the bottom. No, and slide them together. Mm -hmm. And bracing, I, I guess you glue that to the guitar and it all becomes one cohesive unit. Mm -hmm. Bracing, does that help with the resonance of the guitar or is it just for support? Or Well, it's support and uh, it's, it makes a different sound where you put the bracing and the type of bracing and the thickness and everything and the radius. Mm -hmm. I put a radius of about 30 feet on the top of my guitars. So that they have a little curve to them. Mm -hmm. So if the temperature and humidity dries out, it flattens out a little bit, but it doesn't go too flat. Mm -hmm. And it's it's stronger. It's got a little bit of radius. Right. And uh, <clears throat> I use scallop bracing on a lot of guitars, which cuts the the, ra the bracing down here a little thinner, then back up and then down real thin. And that that just gives the top more room to vibrate. And these are called tone bars. And the placement of those changes, I've never experimented with that. Mm -hmm. I haven't built that many. Right. A lot of variables to, <clears throat> to play with, right? So yeah. you could have 50 years experimenting and, and remember those different sounds. So yeah. talk to me about a guitar that you made that had has one of your favorite sounds. That was my third guitar. Your third guitar. Well, my, my first one probably was my, my best guitar for a long time. It was uh, one of the Irvin models that uh, was named after my uncle Glenn Irvin mm -hmm. that uh, taught Richard and I how to play music. 12 fret model. A beautiful sound, real deep, mellow tone. And uh, <clears throat> then after that I built the one that had Dark Deco inlay. <clears throat> and then my son wanted a dreadnought, a zebra wood. So now I built that guitar and put it together. Everything just was perfect, and it was the best sounding guitar, one of the best I've ever heard in the world. Wow! And it's just a fantastic guitar, still is. Was it a warm sound, a bright sound? What was it? It was just a deep, warm, mellow, mellow tone. Hmm. But it was pretty loud too. So you've been trying to replicate that ever since. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I've got one that was almost right on. Does your son still play? Yeah. And uh, I've got a. A lot of guitars that uh, they're a little brighter, maybe more percussive, and uh, had a lot of punch. But they, it's hardly ever that they sound exactly like like that one. Mm -hmm. It's all a little bit different because it's a different wood. So, how many times do you get to perform with people playing instruments that you've made? Oh, uh, once in a while. Uh, What's that like, Pat? Park comes up from Tennessee uh, every few months, and uh, she'll bring her guitar, and I give her lessons, and of course, I, I don't have to give her lessons much anymore. She's pretty good. Right. Pretty good. But it's a lot of fun to, to uh, play somebody that has one of your guitar and really loves it. She she has two now, and she loves them both. One of them is an early model, and the other is a, it's not an OM exactly, it's just a little bit smaller than an OM. So it's totally different for finger picking. Mm-hmm. Have you ever made any other instruments besides guitars? Made one banjo for my daughter that's making that guitar. Never going to do it again? Well, yeah, I might do it again, but uh, it's it's something that you have to do when you've got plenty of time. Build it, and it, uh, she designed with what she wanted, and I put my horse rearing up out of white pearl with gold to abalone mane and tape mm. on the headstock. Sounds pretty. And I had burl wallet. It's like overlay. It's really got a punch, but I put it together. My ri brother Richard, he's been playing banjo for a long time. I couldn't get the sound yet. Just, it just wasn't right. I said, it rattles. He said, well, how'd you set it up? I said, set it up like it did a guitar. He said, you can't do that. 
And uh, so he came over and showed me what to do. And just in a little bit, we had, had a balloon one sand in the veins there. Again, going back to learning from somebody who has experience, right? Yeah. And he's been doing it for years, he's shutting up for people. Cool. I thought I could do it, but I sure couldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so let, let's talk about that side of, of being an artisan or a craftsman or artist, whatever whatever we want, label we want to assign ourselves. Failure. It's part of the process, right? That's right. How, how has failure contributed to your success? Well, I've learned tribulation work with patience from the Bible. So just, like I told a guy, so just cutting pearl. If you cut a piece of pearl for 45 minutes, you get right down to the last thing, and you have to do something wrong, and it goes ping, and the piece is gone. You have to start over. I drank a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> coffee breaks and come back, you know, and everything. Patience, yeah. right? Yeah, you have to have it. The whole day you've been smiling. You love what you do? Oh, yeah. Wouldn't be doing it otherwise, right? That's right. <laughs> I dedicated the rest of my life to music, playing music, building instruments, recording, or teaching somebody else whatever I can do. How can people come and hear you play? And if someone wants to get in touch with you to order a guitar, I'm sure you have a backlog a mile long. But if someone wanted to get in touch with you, how would they do that? Well, you call my phone. 304-653-4306 and we live in Mill Point, West Virginia. And if you mail us, it's 9558 Seneca Trail. Just mail it to Bill Hefner or Hefner Guitars or either one. 9558 Seneca, S-E-N-E-C-A Trail. Mill Point, two words. West Virginia, 24946. Great. All right, I will, so... I will have a website back up again one of these days. Sure. Yeah, well, you know, with, with not trying to mass produce anything, you know, your your backlog always stays ahead of your guitars going out the door. You're still in good shape. You don't really need one, right? That's right. <laughs> and you can get on YouTube. There's a Pocahontas Woods, the local business up here. They put a video out of a guitar built. It was a photo slideshow. And it shows a wall guitar from uh, this right here to the adding stuff to it till it was done. And then I recorded some music on uh, the same guitar and put it in as a slideshow. Cool. So you can go on YouTube and put Hefner Guitars and check it out. Alright, so look for Hefner Guitars on YouTube and you can hear one of them play. So that wraps our first episode of Appalachian Treasures. Be sure to like our page if you want to see future episodes like this. You can also nominate someone or nominate a place that you feel like is a true treasure of our Appalachian region. So until next time, I'm Timothy Luce. Take care.